So we're looking at special interest groups. Uh, it's important to remember that not all are the same, which we talked about last class. Um, but not every interest group hires lobbyists. Not all interest groups are wealthy. All right. Um, for example, the, the Sisters of Mercy have um, lobbyists that work in Washington for them. Uh, but they're not like a wealthy organization. We do know that there are a lot more now than there ever used to be, and we're going to look and answer the questions as to how they influence policy. All right, so we know that the philosophical rationale for interest groups is the fact that the founders thought people in a free society would always pursue their interests, and the, the goal of government was to make sure that they didn't harm others in the process. We know that in the past courts have recognized interest groups uh, and their rights when we look at free speech, assembly, petition, um, and the press. And when we look at the recent findings, contributions and ads are seen as political speech. All right, and we're going to look specifically later at Citizens United. When we look at pluralism, we know that that's the theory that citizens connect the government through interest groups, uh, and those compete within the public sphere, and it really helps to invigorate the idea of the marketplace of ideas. What we are hoping for, it doesn't always happen, but the hope is that there's going to be compromise, moderation, and understanding of all of the different viable options that are out there. If we look back to the Fed 10, we remember that, that, according to Madison, the government's greatest vice was the vulnerability to factions and special interests, and that people are prone towards factions, and as a result, the way that the government, okay, the Constitution was written, it was supposed to allow for factions, but not ever allow it to... Um, disintegrate the the government and our republic because the majority rules so when we look at this idea you can be easily outvoted and a majority faction can control the government all right so that goes back to fed 10. so when we look at the character um, and how they try to influence the government. One way is to lobby. Okay, This is the focus on trying to in influence elected officials. All right, Public affairs committees in an interest group are going to be the fundraising organization that tries to influence elections. So interest groups really perform a whole lot of different functions. They speak on behalf of the members of their group. They mobilize citizens. They tell citizens what's going on. They keep after um, the officials by, by marketing what they are doing. Another example of this, like we talked about before, was with the NRA, how they list and judge each elected official on how they rate them on what they're doing and publicize that to their members. They can litigate on behalf of individuals. So an interest group can sue on behalf of individuals. So it's much like um, anything that gets done. Any of these a person could do, but you're never going to be as efficient as it and doing all of those by yourself. We don't have the time to be doing all of that for ourselves. We don't have access to the poly policy makers to be doing all of that. And we also don't have that same logistical operations down. Um, and so by joining an interest group, we can maximize our voice. And that's really what they're for. So you've got uh, some examples here of your business and agriculture, the labor unions, the professional groups like the AMA, um, your public interest groups like the consumer protection, um, you've got ideological, you've got public sector, okay, those are all different types of, of groups. The key features of the interest group are the leadership, the money, the office location, and the members. So when we look at the leadership, we, we talked about this before, that the initial leadership core is going to end up most of the time, if they're making strides, by political professionals. 
So in the beginning, you're going to start off with the people who are heavy believers in whatever this um, organization is. But through time, they're often replaced by political professionals who can get the job done if the group grows in size. All right. Leaders have to find a balance between the members' interests and keeping themselves politically connected. So we all know operating any kind of a group is expensive, but operating an interest group is extremely expensive. So the way that they can fund this, as we talked about before, is through your membership fees, your donations, and you can advertise in your publications and on your website. Please help us. All right. All right. When we look at location, on K Street in D.C., you have a lot of the lobbyists, all right? And so if you have an office in DC, you're usually gonna have more influence because it is much easier if you are in DC on K Street to go across the street and petition, to talk, to have a lunch with these elected officials or their staff, um, to get to know people, that's gonna be key. Other groups begin local and online and then try to get a, a K Street office. Okay. When we look at these types of memberships, we've got member base with the bottom up structure like the, the AARP and the NRA, those are bottom up. We've got staff based organizations without members like private industries and corporations. You've also got donor based professional researchers like the Children's Defense Fund. So you've got a whole lot of different types of even the way that they have the membership and the way that money's collected. So if we look at AARP, it started as a group that came around trying to get retired teachers uh, to be able to afford life insurance, and now you've got 35 million members. Well, they do this because they give all kinds of information. They give you materials. Um, it's a way to have solidarity, and it's purposive. There's a reason for it. Uh, it helps people band together and work on the legislation that they are interested in. So when we look, all right, at group membership, it does favor people with more education and income because you have more time, more money, and more expertise. You're going to be more likely to ask to join, and you also have a much higher sense of efficacy. And if you've got a sense of political efficacy, you're much more likely to join one of these groups. Over the last decades, we've seen interest groups growing. Part of this is that the government continues to expand, and so there's more places to lobby. Um, the With technology, we have seen also a rise because it's easier to do things as a small grassroots company, excuse me, small grassroots uh, interest group can use the internet and gain in momentum. And that has also changed the way that politics works. So here is a political cartoon. All right. So when we look at direct lobbying, this is an attempt by a group to influence policy process through going to talk to public officials. So you can have meetings, you can have lawsuits, you can have public relations campaigns, which are ads or which are directed at members, um, the public and elected officials. They can also do fundraising right, for a party, for an issue, for candidates. That's the direct lobbying. Um, this we will take a look at. Uh, we studied this in class, so if you were not there, you're going to want to take a really deep look at this, and we will talk about it later. Um, people also do lobby the president. Now, when you are looking at Congress, it's easier because there are um, there are more of them, and oftentimes lobbyists used to be either uh, congressmen themselves or high-ranking congressional staffers. They are able to raise money for the members of Congress's campaigns in return for access. All right. The other thing is the information. They can research co um, very difficult and complex topics that Congress and key staffers wouldn't be able to do by themselves. Again, because it is 
you know, one issue out of many that they're dealing with. When we look at the grassroots, all right, you're going to look at media efforts and lobbying members through Congress. Uh, members of Congress can ask for favors, again, hosting fundraising events, mobilizing the members to vote, come out and vote. But when we're talking about the lobbying the president, it's not, it is not often that that lobbyists are going to reach the president directly. Okay, this is not like a normal tactic that's going to be used. Usually they look for senior officials and senior staffers. And again, the president is needing to know about all topics, a generalist, right? Whereas the senior staffers each have um, specific issues that they are going to be well connected with and well and they're well versed in so when we're talking about mobilizing the public this is really just getting mass public awareness whether it is with advertising all right or protesting getting members to petition congress all right a lot of these happen all of the time there's examples on here um in recent times of what those are about. All right. So again, here are some political action committees and how they've grown since the 1980s. We know that by using these tactics, interest groups are going to try to get favorable legislators elected. You want people who are going to be supportive of your legislation. Okay, we know that with the PACs themselves, you can contribute $5,000 to a primary or general election fund, but you can host as many fundraisers as you wish, and other people can donate. Uh, and so that's a common tactic that's used. And remember, interest groups can also advance or oppose ballot initiatives. We don't have those in New York. Um, when we're looking at the, the initiatives that are brought by the people, um, but in other states, they can when we're looking at who's representative represented by PACs okay we're looking at the money um, and this is showing you here um, okay labor finance ideological and you can take some time and look through these on your own we're not gonna spend a lot of time looking at this by itself but when we're looking at the PACs in 2011 to 2012 by category all right you've got non-commercial you've got labor you've got corporate trade or membership um, or health and then the other category all right so just remember too that nonprofits can't explicitly campaign or fundraise for the election of a candidate but they can do get out the votes they can do report cards and they can raise awareness of their members. And so again, this is going to be a major tactic that is used. So we will continue this by really looking at lobbying itself next class.